What's up? Welcome back to Saturday Morning Time. It is Saturday morning. I am Luke, and today we're going to do something a little bit different. We've been working in Photoshop and on images for months now, and we're going to switch gears for a while, and we're going to move over into the audio world. And I've been playing in the audio world for a long time. We're going to get to that. Uh, it's going to be cool. Let's get started. So let's swap over into my computer here. Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, bum, bum. Smoke them if you got them. It's an important part of the learning process for me. Oh, no. It's all right. I always have a backup. Cool. All right. What are we about today? Let's check it out. I have prepared some slides for us. Uh, I'm just that kind of guy. So let's check it out. Uh, let's make sure I can see me here and that you can also see me and that everything is groovy. All right, here we go. Here we have some slides. The physics of sound. If a tree falls in the woods, what happens? Well, does it make a sound? Of course it makes a sound. We know it makes a sound. That's a stupid question. All right, let's move on. It makes a sound. Who is this series for? This is gonna be helpful for anybody that's working with audio really in any capacity. So that could be somebody that's running a podcast with their friends or their business, for our musicians. I know a lot of my friends have expressed interest in, in this series and learning about that. They come from the musician world. So this whole thing is kind of going to be musician centric because that's I'm a musician myself. Uh, voice over artists will benefit from this for making your voice sound awesome over, you know, a movie or a film soundtrack or a commercial or something like that. Filmmakers, right? Every movie has audio, and audio is one of the most important parts of any video. So this is going to help filmmakers. Science nerds, just because this is kind of interesting information to know about how the world works, right? And the world itself is interesting. This will help people that are restoring audio from old media, like uh, cassette tapes or vinyl to digital, that sort of stuff. People restoring old home movies, um, that sort of work can benefit from this knowledge. YouTube creators, right? Any YouTube video that you're going to make is going to have some audio, and you're probably going to want to do some stuff like uh, duck music under your words. So when you speak, the music gets out of the way. We'll learn how to do that in this series. Uh, live content streamers, like what I'm doing right now for education and things like that. People with acoustic issues in their room. So you might not even recognize them as acoustic issues, but this is like if you have a small uh, restaurant or something and people start talking in that restaurant and it starts getting really loud and then people start talking louder and you have a problem because between the different tables, people can't hear their conversations and we can learn a little bit about how to deal with that and set up our room so we don't have those problems. And uh, really anybody that's going to use a microphone, anybody that's working or listening to sound because we're talking about sound specifically and how it works and it's relevant to anything that you hear obviously so here's an overview of what we're going to talk about in the series we're not going to get it to it all today it's going to be a multi-part thing today we're going to talk about the physics of sound and sound waves and how they work and correlate together um, after that we're going to talk about audio interfaces and IO routing. That's how cables work, uh, what to buy, how it plugs into your computer, how the sound moves around it, how to use outbound gear, what that even means. We'll talk about that in this section. Uh, then we're going to have a section that's just all about microphones and how microphones work, right? The different types of microphones, why you might want to buy one over the other and how to invest that way, dependent on what kind of media you're making and what kind of stuff you like, right? So I'm not going to tell you what the best microphone to buy is or what the best interface to buy is. I'm going to explain to you how these things work, what they are, the different types, and then it's going to be up to you really to make your decision based upon your own work and workflow and tastes and uh, budget. All that stuff is going to come into play, right? We're going to talk about tracks and channels and mixers and uh, the boards that you see at concerts or at open mics and stuff. A lot of us... Um, 
you you might not be in a band, but there's still a good chance you, you're going to have to give a presentation at some point for some group that you're in or a, a business or a ceremony or something like that, right? And you're going to want to know how to manage the mixer or at least know what it does, right? It, everybody knows the hero that comes by the mixer and just, you know, makes a little tweak when the sound guy is and is doing his job. You could be that person and I'm going to teach you how to do that in that section. Then we're going to have a section that is just all about digital audio workstations, the different ones, uh, how what their differences, their pros, their cons, who uses them. Uh, I'll install some of them and we'll actually, you know, record into them and you can see how they differ. We'll talk about gain staging, which is what, where do you set the volume on all of these different things? I mean, when you've got your guitar and an amp or you've just got a microphone and the volume, it's pretty easy. But when you have a whole bunch of, effects in a, in a chain when you're sending that signal through a bunch of stuff and they all have volume knobs, then what do you do? That's what we're going to talk about in gain staging. We're going to talk about equalizers. Most people know what an equalizer is at you know some kind of a high level. This is just giving us a way to manipulate the frequency spectrum that we can hear. Right? And we're going to go over how they work, the different types of filters, problems we can have with them, how you can use them to fix problems. We're going to go over some of the famous types of EQs throughout history because those are relevant to us. They all have a sound that we know and, um, and they're referred to lovingly in the in industry and in other you know, videos that you'll watch and things about sound. So you need to know what things are, like what an API you know, 550 sounds like or does, right? Compression throughout history is going to be much the same way. I'm going to teach you how to use a compressor. This is where we're going to talk about how to do the audio ducking thing for podcasters and compression on a voice. Like my voice is right now being very heavily compressed by a hardware compressor. We'll learn what that means. And we're going to go uh, through some of the famous compressors in history and how they've shaped um, music and the industry that makes compressors now, right? Because most of the today's tools are modeled after some of yesterday's most famous beloved tools. And we'll learn what some of the bigger ones of those are, right? So that's what compression is going to be about. This is going to probably be a big one. And then we'll learn about reverb and delay, which is the, the sound of the room you're in and uh, the echoes maybe of it that we are either natural or that we add on after the fact for creative effect. We'll learn how those work and how to tune them and how to hear them um, in a reverb section. Then then it's going to get um, a little more hands-on, right? We're going to actually start recording and mixing and stuff um, after that. So after we talk about the basic uh, sound, and then we're going to talk about mixers, and we're talk about DAWs, and we'll talk about effects, and then after we've talked about it all, we're going to start uh, working on recording techniques. So we're going to actually start recording a song here. Uh, I'll record a bunch of acoustic tracks with microphones. We'll put them in different placements, and you'll see how they sound. And then we'll work on that. We'll build a bunch of tracks. Then we'll work on some virtual instruments. We'll add some keyboards and synthesizers and pianos and strings and all, all that sort of stuff, whatever fits the song. I'll show you how to work with those things. Um, and then once we've created a bunch of tracks that are both you know, real audio tracks that we've recorded with the microphone and virtual instruments and drums and stuff. Once we've gone through all that, uh, we'll take all those tracks and go over the fundamentals of mixing a song. So we'll take them all, mix them together, and get creative with effects and, um, and choices and panning and things like that. After we've got our song mixed, the next step in the process generally is to send it off to a mastering engineer and uh, we'll go over the fundamentals of mastering and how to take your final mix and make that the best mix that it can be. At the very end, we'll just talk about how to export these songs and how you can work with stems and things and work with other people and transport files back and forth and work with your final, um, final mix down. So this is the overview of what the series is going to be. It's going to be pretty intensive. Um, this is probably going to be the most sciencey part, and uh, then we're going to jump into the weeds. So next up on our fun slideshow here, let me just check the comments, make sure everybody's good, make sure everybody's groovy. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Looks like, oh, Lisa's good. Michael Carpenter's good. Good to see you, sir. I saw him at his open mic last night on uh, Zoom, which ran really smoothly. I really liked it. Uh, so good job with the open mic last night. Michael, good to see you. 
All right. Who's this punk? Who am I? What, what qualifies me to speak about this subject or really any subject? So this slide is in here mainly for you to bring to the power brokers at your organization if you think that they might benefit from my services. So it's a little bit of a resume. I'm Luke McNeil. I'm the owner of McNeil Media Group. That's a creative services company in Douglas, Massachusetts. So we work with uh, a bunch of different industries and we make promo materials and videos and flyers and ads and creative stuff. You know, um, we're like a creative firm. I'm also the founder of The Uncanny Valley. That's sort of a, a it's a magazine. Well, we're trying to get it to print, but right now it's, it's like an e-mag type situation uh, and a podcast and a social community. So I recommend that you check out The Uncanny Valley. It's one of the projects that I'm investing in. It's uh, www.theuncannyvalley.net. I've been playing guitar and bass since I was about 12 years old. I, I always loved it. It was my first like passion. Um, I've been in a bunch of bands over the years. Here's some of them. Mental Evolution. That was with uh, Francine and Matt. And then Thomas and Social Stone were different you know, implementations of a band with my friend John Gerard and Adrian uh, Gilani. And Rabelais with Crystal Joy. We were a duo. And Blackwater Station is myself and Crystal Joy and John Gerard. Uh, I'm also a solo, solo artist, and my alter ego, which you may be familiar with now, is L Boogie, the gangster rapper. So check him out. I have a 15-year history as a Linux infrastructure engineer uh, at some pretty big company. So I've been working in computers for basically my whole life. And really, all of my career decisions in that respect have been to directly support my music addiction and to be able to pay for this gear that I use and to be able to pay for education to learn how to use the gear that I use. So uh, I used really my work at these places to finance this operation. I'm fluent in five programming languages. I write Python, PHP, JavaScript, SQL, and Lua. So I can make stuff uh, with code, which is interesting. And I hold these certifications. I'm a Scrum Master, which uh, a Scrum Master is a, um, is a role inside an agile methodology for working with teams. It, it helps people get work done on a team, right? So I am a Scrum Master. I have A+, Net+, Linux+, certifications, which are old computer certifications. Here's some notable accomplishments. I'm not going to read them all, but these are records that I've worked on, sites that I've made, and uh, other stuff. Some accolades, awards that I've won, times I've been in the news, and here are some affiliations that I have. So you can take this slide, and if you would be so kind, uh, remember it and send it to the power brokers in your organization. This slide is here just before things get out of hand and somebody leaks these photos, so I figured I'd better just get in front of it now. <laughs> this is a thing that happened a long time ago. Uh, yes, this is me. I do have two earrings, and I am wearing a bathrobe and what appears to be a gold chain. I released this as a record, and I'm, it's embarrassing. I know that my buddy Matt's going to... Whenever we have an argument on Facebook, no matter what the argument might be, if I'm winning, then all he does is post one of these. And there's really, what am I going to do? What am I going to say about that? How do I respond to that? What, what, what am I doing? Look at this one. What am I lay I'm like laying in a coffin. I got the earring. I'm, I, I do have hair, though. Look at this hairline. That's fantastic. So this is just some of my, some of my early work. You know, we, <laughs> This is how you can find me. Right, so this is all my socials and, and all that stuff. Now, enough about me. Let's talk about sound. The physics of sound. Let's talk about waves for a minute. Everybody's familiar with them. And there's basically two types of them. And in in not Well, there's lots, but there's two main ones. We have mechanical waves. Right. We have mechanical waves, like sound and water. You can see the... Uh, you can see them in the water, and we have electromagnetic waves, which are waves that do not travel through a medium like mechanical waves. So let me explain this a little bit better. So we have these two types of waves in, in our world, right? We've got mechanical waves like sound. When I speak, my muscles vibrate, my, uh, my vocal cord or larynx or whatever it is up here. Mark Baxter would know. He's a vocal coach. It vibrates your, your vocal cords up here, and that makes your body resonate. And what comes out of your sound hole here is actually moving. It's creating vibrations 
in the air. So it's pushing the air molecules into each other and it's creating waves like you would see in the ocean. This is the same thing, right? When you see a wave in the ocean, you're not actually seeing the mechanical wave there. What you're seeing is the electromagnetic wave, the light that's bouncing off of that wave. But it's, you, you can kind of visualize it in water, right? So sound travels sound can travel through water because water is a medium, right? It's, it's got something to go through. So think about your speaker. When your speaker makes its movements in and out, what is it doing? It's just, it's pushing the molecules in the air and those are creating waves that are traveling to your eardrum and then your eardrum is vibrating and your brain is interpreting that as, as the sound that you hear. It's pretty cool. Let's take a look at a sound wave just to further illustrate what a sound wave is. So I'm gonna pop over into uh, Studio One here. This is my, my DAW of choice. I'm not gonna go into how it works really right now. I'm just using it as a host for some examples. So I'm gonna start up a new project here and we'll create some tracks and let's see what a wave is. So let me just put a track on here. I'm gonna move quickly, so don't concern yourself about what I'm doing so much as where we get to. So what do I need here? I need a noise generator. Or I'll just type, I think it's a tone generator. There it is. And then I need a track to record that on. And then I need a bus to send this to. Don't worry about anything I'm saying right now, unless you know what I'm saying right now. And now I'm gonna send this to the bus. Do, 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 do. Oh, this has to be stereo, I guess. Let me delete this guy. We'll make a stereo track. Call it that. We'll set it to the bus. Boom. So right now we have our tone. Ooh. Yeah, we want to send this to the bus. Cool. All right, here we go. Now I'm making what's called a sine wave. So I'm gonna turn this on and you're gonna hear, let me turn it down so it doesn't blast us. Okay. So now what you're hearing is called a sine wave and let's record this wave and take a look at what it's actually making. I'm gonna turn it up a little. This is playing one frequency and one frequency only. That frequency is 440 hertz. So let's record it and we'll see what 440 hertz looks like. So you can see in my workstation here, this is recording a representation of that tone here. And we'll just let it go for a little while, just a couple seconds. We'll give it a two bars. So until it gets about to the nine, right there. Boom. Okay, cool. So now let's turn this guy off because that's super annoying. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Off. Cool. So now we have a tone. Let's expand this and t take a look at what it looks like. So if we, if we zoom in on this really, really far, we can see what's actually being created. It's just, it's just like a wave, just like a wave that you would see in the ocean. Right? The top part of it is called the crest, and then you have the bottom part of it, and it's called the trough. Right? And this is the, basically, this is the basic basics of all the sounds that you hear, except that we never hear just like one single tone. We hear thousands of tones all mixed together at the same time, generally. So we're going to pop over. Yes, this is A440. That's correct. So A440, this particular tone is the, the internet. I don't know if it's international. I think it is international. The international standard for tuning. So a lot of uh, instruments tune themselves. They play this tone, 440 hertz, and everybody agrees that if their A sound matches that pitch, that tone at 440 hertz, that's when everybody is in tune. So they use that as a reference for tuning. My father, when I was a kid, had a, uh, a tuning fork, and it played 440 hertz. You'd bang it on something. It's just a, uh, it looked like a fork. It had two prongs, and it was metal, and you'd crack it on something and then it would vibrate and those vibrations would make a you know the harmonic sound that would resonate around that tone and all of its overtones so he would use that to tune his guitar to now we have uh, electronic tuners which kind of work in almost the same way <laughs> all right let's not uh get distracted by tuning too much but yes michael's correct in that a440 is significant 
And here's our wave. We're going to pop over into Photoshop for a little bit, and I'm going to talk about some math. So here's one wave, which isn't something that we're generally going to work with, no matter what we're doing with audio, right? You're, unless you're playing with synthesizers and stuff, then you might have a wave like this. But otherwise, this is pretty unnatural. We're likely going to have tons and tons of these things happening. So let's pop over into Photoshop. And, and actually, I want to use Affinity Designer. Let's use Designer instead of Photoshop. And let me find my pen. Come on, designer. Don't make a liar out of me. Mm, designer. Here we go. Fired up. Let's make a new document here. We'll just accept the default. I'm just using this to draw on. And let me grab a brush. Pencil tool, is this gonna do what I want? I think I want this brush tool. I don't use designer much, so forgive me if I'm slow in it. So what we have is a tone, right? We have a wave that's going like this. It's consistent, it's repeatable, it's measurable. We know what it does, right? This, it's, it's governed by laws that don't change. What happens, though, when you play the same tone over itself? Think about what happens when two waves in the ocean meet when they come on top of each other. So let's play another wave here boom right it's at the same time i know that these don't exactly line up because i got a jittery hand right now <laughs> but uh let's imagine for a second so we're playing these two waves at the same time and they're lining up so what are, what is this result in what do you think all that's really going to happen is we're going to get one result here these are going to add together and it's just going to be taller. It's just going to be bigger, right? The waves get bigger. The troughs get bigger. The amplitude is going to change. It's going to get louder. So let's demonstrate this, right? In Studio One, we can, we can make this happen, and I'll show you how it works. Well, let's pop back over into my DAW here. And now we have our single tone. Let's play it for a second so you can re-familiarize yourself or tune your guitar. If you need to tune your guitar, now's your chance. This is an A note, <laughs> so go nuts. All right, here's our tone. Now let's duplicate this tone. So I'm just going to duplicate the whole thing. So now we have two of them. It's the exact, it's a carbon copy, right? They line up exactly. Let's see what happens. Mainly, I want you to pay attention to these, the meters and these faders here. So let me hit, actually, let me just loop this so it keeps playing. I don't have to stop and start it. So the loop range there, we'll loop it. And there we go. And let me turn it down to, or maybe I don't want to turn it down. So I'm going to turn this tone down so it doesn't blow out your eardrums. Because I'm, I'm a good guy like that. And let's turn it down even more. Look at what's happening. I'm turning this down so you hear less of it. But look at what's happening in the meters. So this tone's playing twice. And you can see the levels hitting somewhere around, I don't know, this is like minus 20, minus 18, somewhere around there. But these two meters together are combining, and look at what's happening to our master fader, because they're both playing at the same time. If we mute one of these, look at the master fader, it drops by that much. So it's not actually doubling, right? Let's mute the other one, because that's annoying. It's not actually doubling the volume, like you might think it was. It's just adding uh, a, um, a ratio, a, per a percentage. I don't know what that is. I think it's six decibels or something like that. I don't know the numbers, and you don't need to know the numbers. The point is, this is a phenomenon that happens, and it messes with us in audio all the time, and that's cost me years and years of frustration and thousands and thousands of dollars because I bought stuff trying to fix a problem that was not going to be fixed by buying gear. Right? We can't change the way the world works by throwing money at it. What we can do, though, is understand how the world works and then take advantage of it and use that to fit our benefits. And that's what, that's what art is, right? That's what all art is. So let's zoom, zoom in here and continue with our example. So this is what happens when we have the two waves when they're aligned. Like so. Imagine what happens, though, if one of these meets at the exact opposite time. Like what if, these, what, what if one of these were reversed so that 
Let's pop over back, back into designer. Uh, let's get rid of these waves now. And let's draw a couple new waves. Let's, so we've got this wave. Do, 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 do. And then what happens for whatever reason is we have another copy of that wave that meets it, right? It meets it like this as a mirror copy, the opposite way. What do you think is going to happen? Whoop. This is the least symmetrical wave you've ever seen, but that's all right. Don't blame me. Um, <laughs> blame it on Kane, I suppose. What do you think happens when this wave meets this wave? Because you've got one wave. Whoop. Can't really make a wave kind of shape with my mouse. I got to use the pen. Wave one. Minus wave one. What does that equal? It equals zero. So what do you think is going to happen? Let's pop over into Studio One and see what, what happens if we do this. So let's take our tones. Uh, well, it's the single tone twice. Let's take one of these copies of our tone. This is the second one. And I'm going to just pull this tool on to it. So let me grab my EQ here. Don't worry about this. We're going to go over EQs in a lot of depth. And right now, I just want to show you one button. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. So this button here, this symbol, you see it all over the place. You might see it on your guitar. You see it on mixing boards. You'll see it in your DAW. You'll see it in a lot of, maybe on um, home stereo equipment. What this button does, all it does is it changes the what's called the polarity of the wave. So this is the polarity. It might be positive, right? The wave's at the top right now. If we were to reverse the polarity of this wave, the, the peak of the wave would now become the trough of the wave, right? It just flips over. That's all. That's all reversing the polarity does. So think about your home stereo system in 1987, right? You probably have some kind of tuning thing right? You've got your, your main AV unit, and then there's speakers coming out of it that follow speaker wire, and the speaker wire is just two wires, right? And they're colored. They're color-coded, and so are the back of the speakers, generally. I don't know if they still are, but back in the day, they were. You usually got a black one and a red one, right? One of them's positive and one of them's negative, or one of them's ground. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. So if you plug them in the correct way, you get the polarity, the I'm not going to say the correct way, but you get it this way. If you were to reverse those wires, though, what's going to happen is your, it's going to make your speaker reverse its polarity. So when the music's playing through your speaker and the speaker's going boom, 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 and it pushes out, boom, on the, on the kick drum, boom. When you flip that button, when you, when you flip the polarity, if you were to switch those wires, now the push out becomes a pull in of your speaker. That's, that's what it's doing. And this is how that interacts. I got a little bit distracted about uh, phase, but here we go. Check out what happens if we play both of these tones at the same time. But now I've reversed this one. It's Studio One is not showing you the new image, but this button is taking this wave and flipping it around the other way. You'll just have to trust that that's happening. And now what happens when I hit play? Something broken? What's going on? Well, it's weird, right? Because these two tracks are obviously playing. I see the signal here, but I, I'm not hearing anything. I'm not hearing anything because these two waves are meeting at, at their opposites, right? And they're canceling out 100%. They don't exist anymore. There's no sound being made now because these waves have met and they've canceled each other out. And this plagues us. It's, it's the, the tumor of audio because it happens all the time and it messes with us and we don't know what it is. And then we're like, uh, I don't know what button I hit to fix this thing. And it's horrible. So this is why we're starting here. This is really important to understand. And it's going to help you understand all the other stuff that's going to come after it. This phenomenon is called phase cancellation. I think this is how, um, I don't know for sure. I've never really looked it up, but I think this is how noise canceling headphones work. Right? I think that they have little speakers on either side of them. They have microphones. They record sound. And then they, they take a portion of it, not the whole sound spectrum, just the, the noisy part, which is usually like the lower end of it. And I think that they run it through some phase cancellation, and it makes it go away. 
I think that's what happens. So let's think about, let's go back to our slides here and think about waves again for a second. Mm -mm, where's my slides? So we talked about uh, mechanical waves a bit, sound and water, they're kind of the same thing. Electromagnetic waves, they, they work in a, a similar way, but there's a key difference between them. And that difference is these ones require some kind of physical medium to, to, to go through, right? You, you need either the atmosphere and the molecules in the air, or you need the molecules in the water, or it needs something, sand, maybe, I don't know. Uh, it needs something to go through. Electromagnetic waves, though, are like light, and we can see light in nothing at all, right? We can see light through a vacuum. That's an electromagnetic wave. A radio wave is an electromagnetic wave. Uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, right? So those can travel. Um, depending on their length, how big they are, they can travel different lengths and through different things. And they, they behave slightly differently. But the way that they work, the wave, the peak and the, tr and the crest, that's the same whether we're talking about mechanical waves and electromagnetic waves. So... Let's imagine for a moment that we were to call up Elon Musk. Now let's switch over just to me. We don't need my, my thing. Let's go into a, let's go to pretend land for a moment, shall we? Let's, uh, let's pretend that we call up Elon Musk and we're like, hey, Elon, we want to shoot a music video in space. And Elon Musk is like, that is a, that is a fantastic idea. I'm totally on board. We're going we're, we're gonna to get SpaceX. We're going to make you socially distant pods, and we're all going to go up, and uh, we're going to shoot a music video in space. It's going to be awesome. But you're going to have to bring Tom Cruise, right? We, we need to have Tom Cruise in, in the film. All right, whatever. We'll take Tom Cruise. That might be annoying, but fine. Whatever. He's a great man, I guess. He makes great films. It'd probably be a dope video. So we, uh, we all meet up in California at... at Tesla or wherever SpaceX <laughs> is, and we get in our pods and we shoot off. And after however long the voyage is, I don't know, 18 hours, 27 hours, uh, however long it is, we dock at the International Space Station. And it's cool, all right? We're, we're getting off, we're stretching our legs, we've been making this journey through space. We finally get there and, and there it is. It's, uh, it's Caroline's Cannabis in the International Space Station. She's got like her own uh, kiosk type, a uh, whole retail situation going on. It's the first uh, 21 plus recreational marijuana dispensary in outer space. So we're like, dope. This is perfect. We're, gonna, we're out here at the International Space Station. We got Tom Cruise in tow. We're going to make a music video. We got Caroline's Cannabis. We're good to go. So she sells us these. It's, uh, it's like part of a mask because obviously you can't smoke in space. We'd die. So what she has is they're like the astronaut uh, caps, but they're kind of like they fishbowl. <laughs> so you hit a little button and then they fishbowl. So we're like, all right, this is perfect. This is going to be great for our music video in space. We all suit up, we got our fishbowl helmets, and they open up the doors, and then we, we float out into space, and, uh, and we're out there, and Tom Cruise just somehow knows how to behave out there. He's doing backflips, he's doing parkour in space, and we're like, whoa, that's cool. But the thing is, when we get out there, we don't hear anything. We're like, ah. We're trying to make a music video. There's no music. That's okay with video. I mean, we can take the video. We're going to have to. We're going to have to take the video, but there's not going to be any sound in space because there's no atmosphere in space for the sound waves, for the mechanical waves to travel through. So we don't hear anything. And we're watching Tom Cruise do his backflips. We're, like, we're filming it. We're all like, yeah. Oh, we're in space. Yeah. And we're looking behind him. And in the background, we can see the light from the sun because the light is an electromagnetic wave. And it is awesome. And we're, we're, we're looking at the sun and we're all in awe of its magnificence and its glory. And then right as Tom Cruise is doing his triple axle in space, the sun explodes right in front of our eyes. Now, we're all blind now. That's just an unfortunate, uh, that's an unfortunate um, side effect of this whole situation. We're all blind now. We lost Tom Cruise, so no Mission Impossible 16. But the point here is we didn't hear anything. A planet can explode in space, and there's not going to be any sound made from it at all. So sound, electromagnetic waves, they only exist in our atmosphere and in 
a medium, electromagnetic waves that these can also carry data, right? It's not a sound, but it's data that can be transformed into sound later. Uh, these travel differently. So that's the difference between mechanical and electromagnetic waves. Mechanical waves, they don't exist in a vacuum. Electromagnetic waves, they do. Let's talk about rooms for a minute. Here's the basics about rooms. Rooms are one of the most misunderstood and I guess just not thought about aspects of music production and audio in general. So keep in mind what we've learned now about waves and how they cancel out, right? And with the sine wave as an example, and think about what happens when we make a sound inside a room, right? We, it's not just the sound coming out of your mouth that you hear. You hear that first, generally, like that's the direct sound, but then that sound also goes off in every direction. And if you're in a normal type room like all of us are, there's walls and the sound hits those walls and, and it bounces. But the thing about that bounce is that it doesn't all bounce at the same, it doesn't bounce the same way, right? Different frequencies have different wavelengths and different wavelengths behave differently when they hit different surfaces. So you know this phenomenon, it's built into our brains. We can definitely detect what type of a room we're in, even if we can't see it, just by the way that it sounds. And what we're really hearing is the sound that we're making and how it bounces off the things in the room. And uh, our brain is doing some filtering and some very clever, very fast processing there to, to give us that spatial relation, right? This is super, super, super important to anybody that's listening to or making music because phase cancellation happens here. When the sound bounces off of the walls, those waveforms come back and they meet. And when they meet, they do one of two things. They either meet in phase and they get a little bit louder, right? Or they meet out of phase and they disappear. And that's the, that's the big problem. So it's super obvious with the sine wave when we're doing it in this demonstration because it's just one tone. But imagine that you're playing an acoustic guitar and you strum an acoustic guitar and that guitar sp spreads out thousands of frequencies at thousands of rates and they're all bouncing. And what you're getting back is not the cancellation of all of it, right? It's just little pieces. Some frequencies are canceling out. Some of them are adding up. It doesn't sound right. It's not what you're... What, what's, what you're hearing is not the same thing that's coming out of the speakers. It's being distorted. It's being changed and altered by the reflections in your room. So here's some quick uh, tips about rooms. Squares are bad. Think about why a square is bad. If you're in a square, all the walls are the same distance apart from each other. So when a sound goes out and hits all the walls, they're all going to come back at exactly the same time. That's a problem. That's just, it's, it's a problem because you're going to have much more likelihood of those collisions with the waves and it's not going to sound good and you're going to get frustrated. So squares are bad. If you're in a square room, it's okay. We, we'll talk about how to overcome some of that. But if you're in a square room, it's probably one of the reasons that your recordings suck, right? And you don't want them to. Um, symmetry is bad. That's kind of the same purpose. Uh, the surfaces matter. Is it what are your walls made out of? Are they brick? Are they concrete? Are they drywall? Do you have a carpet? Um, what's your ceiling made out of? All of those are going to have an effect on the sound and how the sound bounces around the room. That matters. Acoustic foam is a lie. Don't buy it, right? Oralex sells this stuff at Guitar Center and they give you a big box of it. Bass traps and it's foam. And uh, hold on one second. This is an Aurelax, but this is kind of the same idea. This, uh... You see people put this stuff all over their like, vocal booths and stuff? Don't. Just don't. You're wasting your money. Um, they'll market it like this is going to solve all the problems of your room, and it just doesn't. We're going to talk about why it doesn't a little bit more. But the key point of this slide, this is the key points for what we're about to talk about. Don't buy the Aurelax stuff. Just don't do it. Tall ceilings are ideal. If you're in a room with a short ceiling, you can, you can get by. It's okay. We can work with it. The point is you're at a disadvantage already. So you have to know that so that you can work with the disadvantage. Let's move on. Home studios. 
these are my home studios over there. This is the evolution of Luke's studio over the years. This picture over here, this is me at probably 18, 19, maybe. This is my mom's house. I'm in my room. This picture was taken from the bed, right? The studio is also the bedroom. I got mic stands in here. I couldn't walk. I got amps. Like, there's no room in here to do anything. But this is what I had to work with, so this is what I worked with, right? This guitar I'm using here, this is the, uh, this is the first thing I ever bought on a credit card. All of this gear, this is when I learned about credit cards, clearly, right? So when I was able to, and actually the real reason I even wanted to leave my mom's house in the first place and get my own house was so I could have a studio. So I didn't know any of this stuff about sound or phase or waves or any of that. I just wanted to make music. And I had a four-track recorder and a computer and I, could, uh, I did all right, but I wasn't getting the results that I... I wanted and I felt like I should be getting. So I got a house and a requirement of that house was I need, I need to have a studio. So I got a little Cape house in, uh, in Oxbridge and uh, this is what I did to it. So this was a 12 by 12 by seven room, a spare bedroom. Um, and you can see all this stuff that I have all over the walls. This, is, this was to try to make that room usable to record music in. Um, because without that stuff, I couldn't even use it. It was disgusting. And uh, this was the space I was in. So I was getting really frustrated at this point. I mean, I've been, let's say I'm here for 10 years, right? I've been trying to record people seriously in here for 10 years, and I'm still not getting the results that I want. I've been reading everything I can read about acoustics and science and EQ and plugins, and I'm spending money on gear, and no, oh, I need this, and oh, if I just buy more acoustic treatment, everything's going to get better. And I finally came to the realization at this point that, that, that I'm chasing the wrong thing. I need to fix the room that I'm in, and then my stuff's going to start sounding good. So what I did, being the uh, overachiever that I am, is I talked to a world-renowned acoustic uh, engineer. Jen's coming in here to tell me something, I think. Uh, you should look at the comments. People are saying that they're not seeing your slides or that they're not getting sound. Oh. Someone's hitting the angry emoji. I see. So that you can see that there's a problem. Oh, uh, I see. How are we doing? We are right now. Thank you, Jen, for letting me know. All right, Jen's let me know. I forgot to switch my screen over to my desktop so you could see what I was talking about. I got very carried away with that Tom Cruise in space. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry. Um. <laughs> All right, thanks for letting me know. I appreciate that. I saw, I thought I was just getting a ton of people. I saw all the things happening over here, all the angry faces, and I was like, yeah, everybody's paying attention to me. But you were trying to tell me something was wrong. Womp, womp, womp. Anyway, so let's start over. So this is, uh, this is the evolution of, of Luke's uh, studio. So this is my mom's house when I'm 17 or 18 years old. Check out my fashion sense, too. I got my, my Clark's Wallabies on. I'm rocking the honeydew. This is fantastic. This picture was actually taken from the bed. So somebody was sitting on my bed and taking this picture of me. That's how small this room was. And this is how I got started, right? So I was buying, you know, what they had. You can see this little mixer in the background. I was buying what they had at Guitar Center and trying to make good recordings at 19, 20 years old, right? So I was getting bad recordings though, and I was working, and I was working enough to pay for all this stuff, which is all I ever really worked to do in the first place, right? And I was like, okay, now I can, now I need to get a house. I, I need a real studio. I need to be able to, you know, have a bed in a different room than my amp. Um, so I got this house, and it was a two bedroom cape in Oxbridge, and I had this spare room right? And it became the studio. But this room is just a, a, a 12 by 12 by 7 cape room. It's, the ceiling's really small. It's, it's kind of squarish. Like, I didn't know anything about sound when I bought the house. Or if I did at that time, I wouldn't have bought this house, right? That's how important this is to me. I'm making the decisions about the house that I buy based on the sounds that it makes, right? It's super, super important to me. Um, so at this point, I was getting really frustrated because I've been working with sound now for 10, 12 years and my recordings suck and I 
don't understand why because I'm I'm trying to simplify it as much as possible, right? I'm just playing uh, acoustic guitar. I'm not recording a drum kit or anything like that, but it just sounds mucky and gross. And then I take it out to the car and it sounds even worse out there. And I was getting frustrated to almost to the point of tears. We're like, why do I even do this? What is the point, right? And I started reading about, you know, I started actually taking the time to learn about how this stuff works. And now I understand why all of this struggle was in vain. So at this point, I decided, all right, I need to make a real studio. So I called world-renowned acoustic uh, uh, architect, John Brandt. You should check him out. He designs uh, recording studios all over the world. And I paid him a bunch of money to design for me this recording studio. And this, was, this is the plan. This is what we were going to do. So you can see, here's the room. Here's where I would sit in the room. And you can see all this treatment that he's got around the walls. And we'll talk a little bit about what this stuff does and how it it works not too much. I mean, if you want to get super into the uh, science of acoustics, you probably want to talk to John Brandt. He's the guy that designed this. What we, uh, what Jen and I decided though, was that this, well, a couple things went wrong here. <laughs> we got the blueprints for this. This is awesome. This would have been an amazing recording studio to build. It was kind of expensive to build, but I, I would have made that work. I would have figured out a way to make that happen. But the problem was it, it's really kind of single purpose. And at the time I was getting into photography too, right? So I couldn't spend all this, all this money to make this really custom, awesome recording studio in my backyard in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. It's not even zoned commercial. It made no sense to do, right? So what we did do instead of this is we bought this McMansion that has what's called a great room. So you can see this room that I'm in now, it's very big and the ceiling's very high. And it's got this slant, so it's not sim super symmetrical, right? The waves bounce off this and come down and then not away from my ears, right? This is designed in a way that just sounds better. So moving to this room alone has really helped me out a lot. Let's talk a little bit more about why that is. So. Uh, 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 uh. Let's pop over into Photoshop. I'll get rid of this. Boom, boom, ba -da, ba -da, ba. I know you guys missed out on some uh, some video there, but I'm pretty excited about that Tom Cruise thing still. It's pretty great. I should have thrown Lord Zeno in there. Um, all right, cool. Let me change my color here. Here we go. So here's a room, right? I'm gonna make a room here. This is a room. And here's your speakers. All right. Here's one. Here's the other speaker. And here's your computer. This is, this is more like a musician's workstation. Uh, this is kind of what mine is set up. It's kind of a common setup. And here's your desk. And then let's make you a different color so you stand out. And then here's your head. Cool. So you're making the next hot track here, right? Let's think about what's really happening. Let's think, keep in mind how those sine waves worked in Studio One and think about what's coming out of these speakers. So, um, let me relight this. Let's change the color again. I'll make a new layer here. And we'll change this color again to purple, because it's right there. Right, so the sound's coming out of the speaker. It hits your ear. Awesome. But it doesn't stop at your ear. It keeps going. It keeps going until it hits this wall. And this is not a straight line. So what I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna use, uh, maybe the pen tool would be better for me. And this is right, gonna hit here and then there. 
like so. It bounces back and it hits your ear again. So this is coming out of this speaker, hits your ear, and it comes over here, hits your other ear. Same thing happens from this speaker. All right, let me make a new layer. Bam. Oops. Oh, the brush was working out better. This speaker, the sound comes out. Bam, it hits your ear. It hits the wall. It bounces back. It hits your ear again. But it keeps going, right? The speakers are also sending sound out this way. Bam, it hits the back wall. And then it comes back to you. And now this one. Bam, it hits the back wall. And it comes back to you. And then a little bit also hits the front wall from behind the speakers. Not that much. This is probably the least important part. And then that comes back to you. Right. So that's what's really happening. You're hearing every sound this many times. This is just the first reflection. It keeps going and bouncing and bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. Right? It does this a ton of times. And our brains filter all this information. It collects all of this information. And our brains do the math and put together the size of the room that we're in based on all these reflections coming back from the walls. Another uh, uh, sad part about that or the, the, <laughs> the part that sucks is that when these waves all come back and collide, they cause those phase cancellation issues, right? And I just, I want to play um, a phase cancellation issue a little more clearly. Like you've heard what happens when the sine wave is reversed, but let's hear a more practical example of what an out of phase thing sounds like. Because um, you can hear it right away, you'll know. Uh, all right, I'm going to grab just a drum loop. Let's grab a loop here. Let's mute these tracks so we don't want to hear that tone anymore. We'll make a new track. Grab this loop here, whatever this is. I'm going to turn it down a little just to not blast you with. All right. Let's go here. I lost my sound when I did that. All right, there we go. All right, so that's what happens when we have one signal. Let's take a duplicate of this. Let's duplicate this whole thing. So now we have two of the same. What do you think is gonna happen? I can tell you what's gonna happen. It's gonna get slightly louder. Right, it's louder, but it still sounds good. Well, I mean, good's relative, but um, relatively good. So let's let's zoom in a lot here, and let's just bump one of these so that the waves don't align anymore. So we're actually, we can get rid of these tracks now. I don't think we need them anymore. Let's just get rid of these so they're not confusing. Uh, to where it is, remove, bam. And let's make these ones bigger. Now you notice these waves don't look like that nice sine wave anymore because they're not one wave. This is the result of thousands of waves being captured at once. That's why it's all jaggedy now because it's not just one sound. This is tons and tons of sounds mixed together. That's how you're getting this waveform. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these and just shift it a little bit. One sample. That's the smallest unit of time I can, sh I can shift. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to shift one sample. Boom. Now let's listen. Let's shift it back. Ooh. Uh, let me make this big again. And let's make our loop here smaller, just so it's easier to work with on the screen. And we'll loop it. All right, that might get annoying, but this is what we're going to do. Or actually, let's loop it to just the one. Jin. All right, cool. So let's zoom in a little bit more on this. And we were just going to shift it. One sample. Hear it? Now let's go back. Hear the difference? There is a difference. I don't know if you're able to hear it through the compression. Let's shift it a couple of, of uh, samples and see 
if uh, it becomes more apparent. There you go. How's that sound on your ears? Let's uh, let's get rid of this loop so you can hear the rest of that. Now there's no effects on this at all. Listen to how different that sounds. All I've done is shift this waveform just by a couple of seconds, and listen to how bad it sounds now. And the thing, the thing about it is, the insidious thing about it is, is you don't notice this is happening because if if you don't have anything to reference it to, that's just what the guitar sounds like, right? Maybe you play with your tone knobs or something to try and make it sound different. But when you do have a reference and you can hear this is happening, then you can tell that you've got a phase issue. And this happens a lot for people that are recording um, uh, like the same source, an acoustic guitar with two mics. So you think about that, you're playing the guitar and then two different microphones pick up the sound, very similar sound at almost, but not quite the same time. That's what you get and it gets that thin, hollow, missing, phasey sound. It's because of phase cancellation and that's all happening because of uh, how the waves are interacting. Now, that happens on the disc like we can see here, but it's also happening in the physical world around you and you can't see that. That's what's happening with the room. So let's pop back over to the room here. So this is what's happening when you're listening to music, right? This is These are called the early reflection points. This is uh, the, these are the first reflection points where the sound hits first and strongest. These really define what the room sounds like to our ears. So this is super important. Now think about, again, think about what this would look like if this room were a square and how these would m m meet, <laughs> you know, how they would clash if it was a square even more so. So this happens once this way. And then what we have is, uh, let's grab another color. I mean, the sound goes off in all the other different directions, but this keeps happening, right, at different rates. And we get a cacophony of sound, and our ears are super smart. Like I said, they're able to filter a lot of this out, and they get data from it, right? What our minds recognize isn't necessarily reality. But when we replace the human here, if you replace that with a microphone, the microphone doesn't have that logic in its brain to filter out this stuff, to make these sorts of connections. All the microphone picks up is this mess, this sonic disaster. <laughs> and that's what this is. Okay, so the way that we generally deal with this problem were, is acoustic treatment. And we're going to take a break, and I'm going to catch up on the comments. And uh, then when we come back in 15 minutes, we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that you can do to mitigate this problem and uh, how we can get by it. Right, so let's take a break and we'll come back in about 15 and everything will be groovy, man. Okay, and we're back. So before the break, we were talking about phase and waves and what happens in your room when you play music and the waves meet each other and their relationship or correlation together. This is super important to us when we listen to music in a room or when we record music in a room or uh, really when there's music happening anywhere. Right, so this is a huge problem for us in audio when we try to record instruments with microphones, especially when we use more than one microphone. Why would you use more than one microphone? The drum kit is really the classic example. So imagine you're recording a rock band and there's a drum kit. You're going to have a microphone on the bass drum. You're going to have probably two different microphones on the snare drum. So the snare drum is a really good example of something that you're probably going to experience phase issues with if you're recording something like a snare drum. Because you put one mic on the top, you put one mic on the bottom, and then somebody hits the snare, right? And when that happens, the, the uh, head of the snare will go down and that will push the air into the, the diaphragm of the microphone, right, one way. And on the other microphone, that will do the, it'll have the opposite effect. So it's, it's creating phase. Those mics are really close to each other and the sound's reaching them both differently, slightly differently at slightly different times. So you're probably going to have phase issues and you can hear that. Let's listen to it one more time, what a phase issue sounds like. So let's come back here. Uh, let's, ooh, here we go. Here's our duplicated track. We're listening to this little guitar riff and here's what it sounds like when this happens twice and it's in phase. 
right? Sounds all right. And then if we slide one of these a little bit out of phase, let's just mess with it a little, a little bit more. There we go. Which one's right? I mean, can you choose? It changes the tone drastically, but that might be what you want because we're talking about creative stuff, right? So there isn't a right or wrong answer and you don't have a lot of control over this. In, um, in live situations, if you're a musician or if you're working with a mixer board and you hear something like this or you suspect maybe there's a phase issue, then you have uh, the phase button available to you and that was the button that we showed you over here, right? It's got a little, it's a circle with a line through it um, and sometimes on like an acoustic guitar, on this inside sound hole pickups, you know, sometimes you reach in and there's a little wheel to control the volume, but there's also usually a little switch. And the, all that little switch does is it inverts the phase, uh, the polarity, sorry. No, the phase is the relationship between these two things. This is the polarity we're talking about. So it just flips this wave upside down so that uh, the wave doesn't necessarily meet at the same way. Now, there's still going to be phase cancellation. There's always going to be phase cancellation. We're just trying to minimize it in the areas where we're, we're paying attention, right? In a snare drum, we don't want frequencies to disappear around, you know, here where the body of the snare drum lives on the frequency spectrum. If frequencies are canceling here, then our snare drum sounds weak and crappy. We don't want that, right? If that Frequency cancellation happens on the snare drum over here, though, somewhere around 10K, where you hear like the, the sort of airy wispiness of, or the, the crack. Maybe that's not as detrimental to the sound. So we have that control to, um, to just switch the phase, but that's all it does. Now, they do make plugins, like really smart plugins, where you can take multiple sources. Like if you took your whole drum kit, you could take all those five, six mics or whatever feed them all into one of these uh, pieces of software and the software will analyze each of those and make sure that the phase relationships between them all is optimal. And that's, that's pretty crazy. Um, we might go into that way later down the road. I just wanted you to know that it exists. So cool. Boom. Now we're on my screen. I got to remember to do that a little bit more often, huh? So cool. What we have here is a picture of, uh, an old band of mine. And here is the histogram. And this histogram is showing us a representation of all the, the light information. Um, so this side on the left here is the dark information. It's the shadows and this tree over here and these, you know, these shadowy bits. And then the part over on the right is these lighter areas in the photo. So this is showing us a, a visual representation of the, the light waves or the light information in the pixels. And uh, what this EQ is showing us is that same kind of thing, but it's showing us across the frequency spectrum here of sound. And this scale down at the bottom is showing us um, the, the scale of frequencies that humans can hear. So we can hear from about 20k. You can't really hear 20k. Around there, you feel it more so than here. That's like at a club where there's really huge speakers bumping, or this is like if a meteor hits or something like that, that then then we're talking 20 hertz but it's the very low low the lowest range of human hearing and then we have 20k up here which is the highest and i don't think anybody ever really reaches 20k hearing but that's some people you know can report that we can hear up to there most people i think um it's somewhere around 17 18k i think is where our ears start cutting off and that decreases as we get older um, our, our perception of sound goes down in those areas. Okay, cool. So we saw our sign, our sine wave. Uh, let me play it again. Cause I wasn't showing my screen. Let me turn it down actually a little bit more cause it was pretty loud. We don't need it to be. Turn down. Let's just turn the whole channel down. Boom. Let's turn that back on. So now we have our sine wave, and let's take a look at what that looks like in the CQ. So this is showing us the one tone because we're looking at a machine-generated 440 tone. It's showing us this at 441. I don't really know why, but it doesn't matter. right? This is uh, a representation of this tone. If we move this up, it gets louder. If we pull it down, it gets softer. Right? We're affecting just that frequency. 
which is pretty cool. And sorry if I just hurt your speakers there. All right, so this is what you're looking at when you're looking at an EQ. On a mixing board, it's, this is usually just split into three knobs, right? You would have the low knob, which would be here. And when you turn that up, you know, it does this. And when you turn it down, it does this. And then you have the mid knob, which would be like probably here, right? This would probably be about where our voices sit. And over here, like this would be bigger. So let's kind of make that bigger. So here's what your mid knob does on your mixing. And then we would have obviously the high knob, which does something like this, right? So we're gonna go over mixers in super extreme detail, not today. Let's stop this. All right, and let's pop back over to our slides. So we're talking about the room and how it was set up to best compensate for these phase cancellation issues. Now you can see that if we pop over to the little Photoshop thing, here was our room, our representation of our room, and you can see all the points at which these sounds first bounce off the wall where I'm sitting right now. So I've taken into account my, um, my position relative to the speakers in the walls. So this is what's actually happening in this room. Now if we look at my room, it's kind of hard to tell from these angles, but you can see these things that I've got hanging on the walls. And in my old room, I had them on the ceiling too, right? Because the ceiling is also, if you think about it, a wall. Um, sound bounces off it, sound bounces off the floor. Um, so in my old room, I had these things lining the ceiling, mainly because it's the only place I had to put them. I didn't have any room in that room to even put anything to absorb these problem frequencies. Um, but now I do. And you can see where I've placed them. These two are on the wall at the reflection point on my side here, right? And there's the opposite here. You can kind of see this one here. And then the back wall, I have these two. So that's where the sound's bouncing off from my speakers. And then I also have two of these things that I built stands for, and these are mobile. I can move them around. So you see this in the old studio. I use them a lot here. So I, I was making walls, kind of, or I was trying to make walls to make the room not a square anymore. I was trying to find creative ways to make this work for me. And it did kind of work. It worked, it wasn't ideal. I mean, the solution was moving to a bigger non-square room. That's the real solution here. But this allowed me to be able to at least proceed and make recordings that didn't sound like total trash. Now, what are these things? They're, um, these are Owens Corning, Owens Corning? Uh, rigid fiberglass panels. These are 705 FRK panels, which means they have a little like um, tinfoil backing on them. And that's like a fire resistant thing because this is the same stuff you use to insulate your house or some houses, attics. Um, so what I did was I went and some of these I bought pre-made from a company called GIK Acoustics. They make these things. And then when I bought them and saw that they really were just couple fiberglass panels surrounded in fabric. I just found a place in Auburn that sold this fiberglass. It's kind of expensive. It's not super expensive. I think I ended up spending like four or 500 bucks total to make all of these. And I went to um, Walmart or Joann's Fabrics or something like that. And this is just black fabric that's stapled to a little wooden frame that I made with a staple gun. And the same, you can kind of see this foot here is just a little piece of wood. So there's not much to these, and um, using the fiberglass at four inches deep at this density, when the sound wave hits it, it just doesn't bounce back, right? This absorbs some of that wave. It cuts it down, right? So that it doesn't all meet back up at my microphone or at my ears. So this helps me to be able to accurately hear the music that's coming out of the speakers and it helps me to accurately record the music that's coming out of my voice or the, an instrument or something like that because I'm, I'm managing those reflection points. So these are the most important ones. In acoustic treatment like this, more is better um, generally. So in nature, we don't have walls, right? Sound, it's, it's a, it's a weird thing. We're conf we have caves, and caves sound a certain way, but we don't have like the right angle kind of bouncy walls like we have in houses. That's a weird thing, and sound behaves in it uh, specifically. Like it, it, it has a sound. Every room itself has a sound, and that sound, people record the sound of the room. 
to add into their mixes because some sound, some some rooms sound really good. They sound really inspiring. Big halls, cathedrals, theaters. They're designed so that these reflections, if you think about an old school theater when they didn't have any amplification back in Roman times or whatever, they designed the, the room itself so that these waves, I, I don't even know how they figured it out. They didn't have oscilloscopes or anything like that, but they figured out how to make the waves bounce and amplify naturally using these phenomena of the, the phase of the waves, which is nuts. It's nuts. Mm, excuse me. Got a problem here. So here's something that you can do if you're really serious about uh, according, uh, recording um, acoustic instruments specifically, though most people, I think, some of the people on this uh, on this webcast are definitely musicians and are doing this, but most people can also benefit from this um, without this kind of severe treatment, right? So the biggest thing that you can do to combat the phase cancellation issues is to use the right microphone. That's These are designed with this in mind. That's why you see this SM58. It's the most popular microphone in the world. You see them everywhere. They're at every open mic. They're on every pedestal. They're at the White House. They're on famous recordings. You see Steven Tyler with this thing. It's $98 at Guitar Center, always. It never goes on sale. It never breaks. Everybody has one, two, ten of these things, and they follow you for your lifetime. These are excellent microphones, and they are great for rejecting sounds that you don't want. So this takes a lot of energy to make a sound, because we're speaking into the microphone, we're speaking into the microphone, and that's pushing the air, the air is vibrating. The air is vibrating a diaphragm in here. It's a little bit protected on this particular microphone because, um, because it's made for really loud things, all right? A singer singing as loud as they can into one of these things, that's, think about your eardrum. Imagine somebody being three, not even three inches, an inch from your eardrum and singing as loud as they can into it. Right? That has to be tough, right? So this, this has some layers of protection for the diaphragm in it. Um, this will take that signal, it has to be loud, it has to be strong for it to even work, it'll take that signal, and then it kind of, the bounces back from the walls aren't strong enough to get picked up by this microphone. I mean, they do a little bit, but it's not super bad. The problem people run into, though, podcasters and um, people that are doing video conferencing and stuff like that, is you see people on YouTube that go out and buy these fancy looking condenser microphones and they're, they are cool. They're, they're cool and they, they sound great, but they're not, you need to take into account the room that you're in and how those things work. So we've got this microphone that's an old school dynamic microphone. And again, we're going to talk about this in depth later. Um, but you've got this type of microphone and it requires a loud source or a singer very close to it. Right. And it's not, it's not about picking up the, the super fine detail in Celine Dion's voice. This is for picking up Steven Tyler's voice, right? People go out then and buy these fancy mics that are all shiny and they look cool and you see your favorite YouTube artist using one of these and you think, if I go out and I spend two, three hundred, four, five thousand dollars on a microphone, right, that's going to make my my music or my content, it's going to make it stand out for sure because nobody else is going to have this great gear, right? If I, if I use the same gear the pros do, I'll get the same results the pros do is, is a pretty common thought, but that's not the case, right? Now, you could go to Guitar Center and buy something like this and they'll sell it to you cheap and make it look like this is going to solve all your problems. But this is super sensitive, right? This is electronic. This is, a, th this is actually a tube mic. It's not a condenser mic. Um, there's a tube in this. Um, but for all intent, let's pretend this is a condenser mic and, uh, and this is electronic and it uses power to amplify the signal, right? This is made to, to collect much finer detail in things and much softer sources like a, a violin <laughs> or, uh, well, violins are very loud, but something soft, you know, Celine, the lip sound in Celine Dion's voice or airy vocals, things like that. Something that's very, very crisp and detailed. 
that's what you want a condenser microphone for. Not for voiceover work for your podcast in your bedroom. Because if you do that, you're going to run into this situation over here that we drew out in Photoshop. Right? And here's your microphone. It's this thing. It's super, super, super uber sensitive. And it is going to collect all those waves. And they're all going to get baked into your recording. And then you're going to have phase issues all over the place. You're not going to know why. And that's going to drive you insane. So you're going to spend time looking at what, how, what's the best preset to fix or what's the best microphone or what's the correct mic technique. And that's not going to solve the problem. What would solve the problem is just using this $98 microphone from anywhere, right? So I, you can record uh, an acoustic guitar or something like that with one of these. And if you're in a small square room like this, I recommend that you do right? It's not the great, it's, you're not going to get, um, a pristine finger style, classical, super fidelity recording, but you got to work within the constraints of where you're at. If you need that recording, maybe you should take, get like a, a portable recorder and bring it to another place like, um, your town library or someplace that's big, um, town hall. See if you could use that or another room somewhere, even outside, you see what that sounds like. That sounds unnatural, but you could, play with that and see what that sounds like. So that's uh, one way that you can effectively mitigate this problem um, on, the, on the super cheap. The only thing is, like I said, you have to be really loud with one of these microphones. I know a lot of singers that just aren't really loud, and that's okay. Right? You don't have, not all singers have to project loud. That's fine. That's a, a, it's stylistic. It can be stylistic. Um, and that's difficult to manage with a microphone like this because a microphone like this doesn't have any power. You have to amplify this with something. And that's where the outbound gear comes in. That's where the audio interface comes in and the preamp and, and that sort of stuff. That's when we start talking about mixing boards and cables. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about that next week. Um, so yeah, one of these is going to help. It, it's a, a especially going to help somebody that's loud and projects and on sources that are loud, like guitar amps and things like that. Those are pretty easy to record. Uh, it's going to struggle with acoustic guitars. Uh, there are some great recordings that were recorded with this, this guy's brother or cousin, the SM 57, which is basically just this thing without its, its wind cap on, right? All this little cap is, is a screen that deflects some of the reflections and it also has a little uh, like a foam bit in there to try and protect against some plosive sounds like the P's, the P's and the S's, the sibilance. It cuts down some of that for a vocal mic. But if you were to buy its little brother, the SM57, it doesn't have this little windscreen on it. It's more like this, right? Pretty much the same mic, though. So that's interesting. And these are great. And you should definitely have one. If you do audio, you should have an SM57 or an SM58 or at least something that is, you know, well modeled after one because these are the best. Can't argue with it. Awesome. So we've seen that one of the largest problems in, uh, in recording and listening to audio is phase cancellation. And one of the biggest culprits or, or, or um, magnifiers of that is the pretty ubiquitous condenser microphone that people use in the wrong application, right? Another way that we can deal with this phase issue is that button that we talked about, the phase cancellation button. So you can use that if you're doing a live performance just by flipping the button, right? You just listen to it. Does it sound full or does it sound thin? Flip it. Do you like it A or do you like it B? Flip it. Because the answer is there isn't a right answer, right? It's just the phase. Of, it, it's how it's the sound is interacting in your room, with your instrument, in your environment. So it's going to be different every time. Nobody can tell you the correct place to set the phase in any given situation. You have to listen to it. And it's super apparent, right? We, we listen to it here. Let's listen to it one more time. Phase issues. Let's mute this. Let's open up these two guitar tracks. And we're going to listen to in phase and out of phase one more time, just so you can hear it. And it's not like something you need formal training to figure out. It's super apparent. All right, there's a guitar track. Let's make it big so I can see what I'm doing. Let's move it out of phase a little. Let's mess with it. Try and make it go away a little more. 
I still hear that tone in the background. Let's turn that off. Where is that coming from? Boom. Where are you coming from, buddy? Anyway, you get the idea about the phase, I think. I think we're good on phase. All right, so these uh, absorption panels, they help a lot. They made my old room usable for me, at least. It wasn't good, and it was super, super frustrating, and I struggled a lot there. But and they made it so I could at least use the room. You might say, and you might be right, uh, let's open uh, uh, Photoshop. Well, if this is a problem with the sound coming out of the speakers when I'm making my music, why don't I just use headphones? And you're, total, and you're totally right. That does solve a lot of these problems. It creates different problems, right? Because not everybody's going to be listening back to the music that you're making in headphones. And you don't have the same illusion of space that you have with, uh, with speakers, right? And even though more and more people are listening to music through their AirPods or earbuds and things like that, you don't listen to those in your car. You're, you still listen to the sound coming out of your stereo laptop speakers, right? You're not always going to be listening to headphones. So you need to at least make sure at the end of doing your mix, you might use headphones as a tool to compensate for some of this stuff, right? But at the end of your mix, you're going to have to check and make sure that it still sounds good coming through speakers. Now, there's another phenomenon going on here that we haven't really covered yet, and that's that this is a little bit, I don't want to say it's frequency dependent, but the different notes, the different frequencies, they make different sized wavelengths, right? And those behave differently. So the lower frequencies are where we have most of our problems. And it's because those wavelengths of those frequencies, the bass notes and the kick drums and uh, the lower muddiness of my voice, um, those happen at the lower end of the spectrum. So let's take a look at our EQ spectrum real quick. Uh, here's Studio One. Bah, 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 bah. Let's bust this open. All right, so we're talking about stuff around here, like 100 to 500-ish, this ugly 60, 80, 120 area in the frequency spectrum. This is where we have a lot of problems because this is where those waves are large. As we move over towards the right side of the frequency spectrum, the waves physically, the mechanical waves, they get smaller. They get smaller and they don't travel the same way. They bounce easier. Right? And they're also absorbed easier. They're just not as strong because they're so small. But down at this side of the spectrum, the waves are big and they're strong and they're hard to absorb. That's why these traps have to be dense and they have to be thick because these waves are big, right? Um, so one thing that we can do um, is to mitigate our phase issues in a lot of different instruments, especially this is a good trick for acoustic guitars and things like that is to just cut out the low frequencies. We can just turn those frequencies off so that there are no, there's no information in this area on those guitars, right? Let's see, let's just, we're not going to go big into EQ, but let's just hear what this guitar track sounds like if we were to do that, right? I'm not saying that this has huge phase issues right now. Just listening to one of them. Oh, that's a tone. Where's this tone generator come from? I don't even see it. They're all off. Something's messing with my head, man. Let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of it all. I ain't got time for this. Let's just make a new song. Tone generators are off, man. It's messing with me. All right. So here we go. We got our new song. I'm going to grab a loop here. We'll grab a different one. Just to be different. So think about what you're hearing there for a little bit. Does it hit you in the chest at all? Does it um, does it do anything for? Uh, yeah. Does it does it make you vibrate? Does it make you feel anything? Do you get punched by anything? Listen. Listen again. Not really. It's kind of high pitched, actually. It's kind of high pitched, and there's no bass there. There's no kick drum. There's not a whole ton of information at the low end of the frequency spectrum or at the like low end of the audio histogram. There's just not much going on there in this sound. So, 
anything that is going on in that portion of the sound is just kind of just noise. It doesn't need to be there, and it's making our mix worse than it has to be. So we might come into... Uh, ooh, what am I doing? Ba -ba 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 -ba. We might come into our equalizer here. And let's see what that looks like on the equalizer. Let me just turn it down a little so it's not annoying. Boom. And you can see where the information is in the song. These are all the different frequencies that are playing together in this waveform. And you can see that there's some information down here in 50. We don't really need that. Like you can't even hear that. All this is doing is causing weird, ish weird phase issues with our other instruments that we do want to hear down here. Right, so we can just cut that out entirely. So I could just take a filter here and be like, I don't even need, I don't even need this. So let's just play our song, play our loop. Let's make this loop. And let's just filter this. I'm gonna take this filter and cut away the bottom frequencies so they're just not, not even affecting our mix anymore. Listen. I don't hear anything yet because there's nothing there to hear. Now I'm starting to hear it a little bit. It's thinning out the low end, but it's not really... This isn't really changing the tone of the guitar much. It's, it's thinned it out a little bit. It, it's, not as, uh, it's not as big, it's not as wide, and that's good when we're talking about mul mixing multiple sounds together. Right? We don't want this particular sound to take up all the space in, in the mix. That'd be bad. We want to leave room down here where we could have things that take the low energy, like a, a, a boom, like the body of an acoustic guitar or a kick drum or a bass or uh, toms or something like that. So we don't want our guitars to even live down here. It doesn't make sense for them to. It's just causing us issues. All right, so we can keep going with that. Let's see what it sounds as I go all the way across the spectrum. You can hear what it sounds like as I take the frequencies away. Starting to hear it now. Sound's still there. We just don't have any of the low, low waves down here. And this doesn't sound so good on its own. But that's okay, because when we're making music and stuff, we have tons and tons and tons of tracks that we're layering on top of each other, and those other tracks fill the space. And by giving them the space to fill out in the spectrum here of sound, you can hear each one of them more clearly. So if you think about it like you go into uh, some kid's band recital, right? The parent, every parent in that place wants to hear their kid as clearly as possible. And if all the kids are playing at the same time and all that sounds bouncing off everything, well, you can't hear any of them super clearly. Right? When we take the EQ and we start cutting things out and making spots for each individual kid or each individual instrument on a stage or each individual person on a podcast, now we can make space for each mic and they all start to sound better. They say, and, and actually, counterintuitively, they sound bigger. And they sound bigger because we're creating space for things to live in. They sound bigger because there's the illusion of something going on between the sounds. It's not just one big wall of one sound, right? With their space in it. So it makes it sound big and massive and hard and deep. There's depth to great mixes. We know this. We probably don't hear it so much on a lot of like laptop speakers and stuff. But if you think back to the day when you used to really listen to music, Maybe some of you still do. I mean, I, I I can't say that I even really listen to music the way I used to listen to music. But think back to then and what the music sounded like. And this is how it was all made. It's pretty primitive back then, too. And even like 10, 20 years ago. So these the tools aren't hard to use. And now that I think you understand um, uh, waves and phase all of the other stuff that we do in the DAW and in mixing is going to make more sense. Like now you're going to understand how a phaser works on a guitar, right? Let's let's listen to our sound and and hear what just boosting a frequent one frequency and then we'll sweep it around and just see what that sounds like. Have you ever tried that before? 
it's kind of illuminating. Let's make this really thin. So we're only working on one little frequency. And you can hear what sound sounds like across the spectrum. Let's check it out. Actually, let's not use this. Let's just use noise, because that's a better example. So let's grab a track. We'll put on our tone generator, and we'll use noise. Right, this takes style or anything out of the equation, so we don't have to worry about that. So instead of a sine wave now, we're just going to use pink noise, which is a collection of frequencies all running at the same time. And we can use this as a reference or as an example. It's helpful as a tool. You're familiar with the sound? Let's see what it looks like. It's not quite even across the spectrum, but it's pretty close. Right? It's representing all the sounds, even ones up here that are at the very limits of our hearing. So let's listen to what each individual frequency sounds like. I'm just going to sweep it slowly. Sorry, I got stuck there. This is where I don't hear anymore, right at about 15 or 16. But some people might hear there. And this is going all the way to 30,000, which I think the dog can hear. So we're just sweeping across all the frequency spectrum and we're just turning up one frequency at a time. Let's do it the other way, and I'll turn this down, and we'll take a frequency away. It's disturbing. Right? It's a, it's a strange sound. Uh, let's turn off that noise. So that's how the EQ works. Now I think we're going to take one more break here. We'll come back and uh, continue along our journey of sound. Okay. So you're hanging out with your buddies. And you're like, ah, I just got this cool recording software. Bring over your instruments. I'm going to make a record. We're going we're gonna to form a band and we're going to make a record. So everybody comes over and they all play their parts and you record them all and it sounds okay, right? And you spend the whole night, you're up all night, you're like, I'm going to make this sound amazing. It's going to be like a radio song by the time I'm done with it. And you spend all night and you're working there, you through, you're throwing plugins on it. You're like, you're getting enticed by sales on, oh, this new plugin's going to make you mix. It's going to bring you to new heights. Is it everything you need? So you're dropping money, you're pulling out your credit card, you're buying stuff you can't afford. And your mix sounds awesome. You're like, yeah, this is great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it out in the world. But before you do send it out in the world, you take it, you rip it onto a CD or whatever, and you take it out to your car. Because you listen to a lot of music in your car, like most of us do. So that's the place that you know music the best. So you go into the car, you, you take your mix you've been working on for hours and hours and hours, and you listen to it, and it sounds like a pile of dog shit. And you're like, what the hell? It doesn't sound like this in my room. What happened? And what happened is all this phase cancellation stuff we're talking about. You record a track over track of acoustic guitar, and then you mic'd up some amps, and you recorded some basses, and then we pop over here, and I'm going to show my desktop this time before everybody yells at me for not showing my desktop. And then we pop over to, uh, to Photoshop here, and this starts happening. <clears throat> and we're recording this over and over and over again, and we're layering it, and then we're hearing it back, and it sounds money to us. So we take the EQ, and we roll some of it off, and we fix some of it, and we apply some stuff, and we're like, cool. We compensate for all this in our mix. But then we take our mix, and we bring it into our car, and we listen to it, and our car is not set up this way. Our car does not have these same reflections. Our car does not experience the same phase cancellation, phase cancellation issues as the room does. It has its own set of problems and phase issues but they're not the same as this and if you've been working on your mix and you're compensating for your room like this and then you take it elsewhere and listen to it well you made a bunch of adjustments that just don't make sense so not only have you wasted your time and all the time that you spent mixing this song you're making bad decisions because you're you've been being tricked right by your room um you've spent all that time on your mix and now you're kind of hosed so 
that's what's going on. And that's what frustrates a lot of musicians and home recording artists. Now, I said really early on in, uh, in this presentation, don't buy the Oralex foam. Now, that's not to say the Oralex foam doesn't have a place, because it absolutely does. But the, that place is not this problem. That's the thing I'm trying to explain. So you can go to Guitar Center and you're trying to, you know, I would go to any music store in the state or in New England even to find a solution to this problem because I really want to make great music, you know, and I can't. And this is, this is a problem. So I'll go all around the state looking for whatever I can buy, right? You see things like, like this. And this is made to go on a mic stand, and you would put this behind the microphone, like so, to try and catch the, uh, the sounds before they reflect off the wall and start causing some of these issues. And this, it does work, it does a thing, but the thing that it does doesn't solve the problem that we have. And the reason that is, is because the, the problem that we have, if we pop over into Studio One, it's with the bigger waves, let's open up, uh, Let's open up our EQ. And I'm just gonna m mute this and play it. Will that work? No, I'm gonna just turn our main fader down and play this. Whoops. Hold please. Let's get this situated. Let's unmute this guy. There we go. Let me delete what we got going on over here. So the reason that a product like this isn't gonna do what we might expect it to do for us and our instruments specifically, it does kind of help with the voice, but the, the reason it doesn't solve the problem is because it doesn't do anything here. Where we have the problem, you can even, you can see this big boomy bit right here, right? This foam is acting on these frequencies over here where our voice kind of lies, where this is like the telephone range. Right? This is where a baby cries. This is where our brains hear the sound the most acutely. It's the strongest to us around this area here. That's where the foam works. And the foam solves problems like uh, it's called flutter echo. So if you've ever been in a staircase, for instance. So if you're in a staircase and you clap your hands and you can hear that echo of it, bah, 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 flutters. This kind of foam, it works on those high frequencies, the the fluttery, uh, airy frequencies up there. It doesn't work on these moom, boomy, muddy, gross frequencies that we all uh, love and enjoy, <laughs> right? So that's the problem. What does work though in these areas here is this fiberglass stuff and what's called, um, the fiberglass affects kind of this area here, which is the middle maybe of an acoustic guitar and the lower end of my voice. It's not going to do much for a kick drum, right? All these panels that I have on the wall, they're not really going to reach down to where the kick drum lives. The, the, the waveform down here is too big, right, for it to even go, for it to be absorbed by four inches of this foam. So let's look at exactly how the foam uh, works for us and how the bass traps work for us. So you, we talked about the positioning of them, right, but we didn't talk about the corners here. Now, the corners are also important, but the, the corners are where the bass builds up, because think about what's happening. If we pop over into Photoshop, uh, where's my pen? Do, 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 do. Where'd I put my pen? Da, 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 da. There it is. So these are the, the strongest reflection points of the sound where all these lines are, but the sound goes off in every other direction too. And what happens is the bass waves, the biggest waves, they find their way into the corners of rooms and they do this and they expand and they get bigger and they make your room sound like a boomy, muddy mess, right? And that gets recorded. And this happens in every corner and not just like the wall to wall corners, but also the wall to ceiling and the wall to floor corners. This is happening anywhere there's a 90 degree angle. The, the bass waves get trapped in here and they do this. It's not such a problem with the, the treble end, the high end of the spectrum, because they bounce a few times and they bounce a few times and they're just, they're small. They, we don't have phase problems with them because they're, the waves are small enough that they don't align poorly that often in ways that bother us the way that these bass ones do. Um, 
so you'll notice if we pop over into my my rooms room rooms here in the corners i have these triangular things and these are called base traps they're thicker than the four inches but they're the same thing right they're filled with the same kind of stuff and there's some air gaps in here and some science and math that make these um absorb some of that base right in this room i don't have enough base trapping so i wouldn't be making music like uh i wouldn't be mastering house techno kind of deep bass music um most of the type of music and work I do is like a, your standard rock band, so it's not like a sub club bass. I'm not really worried about it that much. Um, so this would be the first area that you want to treat because this is the it's the hardest area to treat, <laughs> right? And it's probably the most problematic. Next to the corners, though, then we treat those reflection points that we see in Photoshop here. Let's just get rid of our scribbles. And when we make or hear our sounds, we absorb as much of this as possible so that our recordings end up clean. And then when we layer recording after recording after recording, they don't get filled with all this mud and space and echoes and stuff and reflections that we don't want and cause phase issues and all that jazz. So let's pop over here to my next slide. We've, we haven't talked about slides in a while. So let's pop over here to the slide and we'll talk about frequency absorption just a little bit. So everything that's in your room affects the sound that happens in your room. So everything that, every hard surface bounces, the high frequencies bounce off it. It, it changes the waveform of things because it's just, things are bouncing and it's, uh, it's alive, it's moving around. Um, all the soft surfaces absorb things. Like the curtains absorb the highest of the frequencies, those, that 15 or 12, 15K or somewhere around there. Uh, that's like airiness or breathiness of vocals they, that the stuff in your room affects all that so you don't hear the problems as much all right um, but bass there's not too much in your room naturally that's gonna act as a bass trap i mean you got maybe a couch or something like that and that may maybe will do something but it's not it's just not dense enough right it's just a kind of a cotton cushion generally so that's it's going to have an effect on the sound of the room but not that low in the frequency spectrum where we're having our problems so here i want to call your attention before this comes <laughs> before this comes out this is a post i made on the home recording bulletin board um which i became a member of in november of 2001 <laughs> that's the same year that dr dre's 2001 came out fantastic I made seven, about 700 posts on this uh, forum over my lifetime, and this particular one was in 2008. You can see my handle here. This is how old it is. I'm, my handle was dementia, spelled wrong. Yeah, I'll just let that sink in for a second. And then under here, you can see, I think this is like my AOL Instant Messenger, maybe? I don't know. This was 2008, so who knows? But let's let's see what kind of problem I was having. What was I posting on this forum? Uh, you probably can't read this, so I'll read it to you. I wrote, can you help me with this room, please? And at the time, I was referring to this room up here. This is the same room, these two images in the top right. I said, this is a Cape style bedroom, 12 by 12 by seven, hardwood floor, horsehair plaster, and lath, lathe, walls. I don't remember how to say that. I've treated it a bit, albeit on a whim and not really knowing what I was doing, with four strips of Oralex foam and an Oralex base trap in each corner. Now, uh, Oralex is a company that makes the, these foam acoustic panel treatment things, and you can get them at Guitar Center or retailers or music stores, so they market to us or to musicians. So I had gone to Guitar Center and I bought a bunch of this foam stuff and I put it on the walls and it didn't do what I wanted. So now I'm on the forum saying, why didn't it do what I wanted? I'm recording with three singers, two of which are playing guitar and one direct keyboard. I, th I thought, I think that's what I meant to say. I thought if I give everyone their own condenser, I get absurd fade is phase issues. If I use a single omni, that's a type of microphone, in the middle... I'll get what I believe is the sound of the room. Everyone sounds much farther away from the mic than they actually are. Sounds a bit like sitting in the last row of a church. I'd like to tighten up the room so I can record with an Omni and have it sound better. 
Monitoring is boomy, probably because I bought foam bass traps from Guitar Center instead of Ethan's. Ethan Weiner is an acoustic expert. He actually wrote some books on acoustic theory, and he owns a company called Real Traps that makes bass traps. So I'm saying I didn't buy Ethan's real bass traps. You know, I went the cheap way. I just went to Guitar Center and bought what they had. I said, I'm not a DIY kind of guy when it comes to hammers and nails and staples, so I didn't really want to build one myself at the time. I was considering putting some Oralex diffusers on slants going up the ceiling. But before I waste more money, I'd rather check with the experts. I don't mind dropping three or four hundred bucks, but if I'm going to do that, I want it to do what I want it to do. Like, if I'm, if I'm going to spend any more money on this situation, I want it to have an effect. Uh... I placed the bass traps about three quarters of the way up the corners. Would there be a point in buying four more to place below them going all the way down to the floor? And then Ethan Weiner, this acoustics expert, he, he replied to me and he just says, you never learn, do you? Stop buying the Orlex foam. It's not going to solve this problem. But I wanted it to so badly because it was obtainable. What I ended up doing, obviously, in this room was just biting the bullet and finding the foam and making it. And now, this chart up here in our frequency absorption thing. This was in Ethan's book, The Audio Expert, Everything You Need to Know About Audio. Ethan Weiner wrote this book, and he did these measurements with some uh, you know, scientific calibration microphones to figure out the coefficients uh, of these different materials at different densities. All right. So there's a few different types of uh, insulation that are really common in this kind of application. We have Owens Corning 703, which is just a two-inch... Um, panel of fiberglass, rigid fiberglass. And he, Ethan figured out here, I don't know if he actually did the measurements. I think he did. Um, but he compiled it at least. At what point on the frequency range do these, uh, these materials absorb frequencies? And you can see that the 703 does a great job absorbing frequencies here around 500 hertz and one kilohertz, up to two kilohertz. So that's, that's great for our human voices. Right? That's good for acoustic guitars and things like that. It's not great for 808s and kick drums. It, that's nowhere near an 808 or a kick drum. The, that's, it, those low sounds aren't even on this spectrum at all. That's it, lower than 125. So we're not even talking about the same thing here. Uh, these are to absorb the uh, a little bit higher, like three, 400. And you can see these ones here. This is... Uh, 705 FRK. The FRK refers to this little tinfoil backing that they have. It's some sort of fire resistant thing. So if your house catches on fire, it stops it from going up your walls. Um, in these ones that I made, I pulled that off. So I don't have that, that panel. It's just going straight through. So I, well, I've doubled up panels and this is where they're effective. The frequency range, they're effective. And these are the frequency ranges I needed it to be most effective to record the primary instrument that I record, which is the acoustic guitar, right? That's my, I play the acoustic guitar. That's my main instrument. It's the one I love. It's, I want to be true to its natural sound. I have different guitars that sound different ways and I want to capture that accurately. Most of my friends are singer songwriters. So when I record them, they're playing the acoustic guitar. Most of all of what I do revolves around the acoustic guitar. So the treatment that I put on my walls revolves around the acoustic guitar. If you want to do EDM, hip hop, bounce kind of music, use headphones because it's going to cost you a lot of money or, or build something like this, right? Go talk, to, um, go talk to my buddy John Brandt and get yourself a real studio. You can see how much treatment he has in here for me. This is where I'd be sitting. Everything on this uh, front wall is slatted this way. So it's slatted. So when the sound waves hit this, they come back you know, broken. They don't come back the same way. So they don't meet in the middle. And, ha and cause issues. Everything in this room that he had built out, this is the back wall. You see all these little jagged things that you see in studios sometimes? This is to diffuse the sound that hits the back wall so it doesn't come directly back at you. It gets scattered throughout the room. And then after it gets scattered, all these other traps absorb all the little pieces of it. That's how this works. And you can see in this particular design, he went full out. And this is all that, like the HVAC stuff and everything is completely isolated in a little chicken coop off the side, outside the walls of the studio. So all of the, anything that buzzes, any condenser units, electricity stuff, this is all silent. Like, like Tom Cruise in space. It's just like Tom Cruise in space here. So if you're really super serious about doing that, uh, doing uh, mastering or, um, or like 
uh, hip hop EDM low frequency type stuff. This is kind of the direction you want to be at. Where I'm at here in my studio is I can do what I do. And what I do is pretty wide, right? But I, I don't really delve too far into club music. If I did, I would get myself a subwoofer and a lot more bass trapping here. I would put the, uh, those panels all along where we have 90 degree angles here. And that would help me out in, in being able to hear all that sound accurately. Groovy. So this shows you sort of how that works. And you can kind of understand how the foam works. Generally, you use them kind of together. Right, we would put the foam up at the top to kind of take care of the fluttery echoness of the high frequencies. But there's enough stuff in this room that it's not a problem for me in my recordings. We use a dynamic microphone instead of a condenser microphone if we're in a position where we can't control the reflections of the sound waves off the walls. We do that because this is designed with that in, perp in mind, right? This was made for in opportune rooms and for broadcasting and for speeches and for outdoors and it's made for everything. So this is, it, you have to speak loudly into it. It has to be amplified by something down, the, down its line, right through the cable that it plugs into something somewhere and that turns the volume up even more. Right. And, um, that's a requirement of this and that helps to cut down all these problems that we've been having. It's a pretty simple solution. Spend the hundred bucks and spend, instead of spending the thousand bucks. Because if you do spend a thousand bucks and then you end up disappointed, it, it's disheartening, right? We put a whole lot of time, money, and effort into this. And when you don't get the results you expect, and especially when you invested so much time and energy into it, it's super, super, super frustrating. So get, get, use a dynamic mic until you think you're in a good enough room to use a condenser mic. Next on here, let's just talk a little bit more about the frequency spectrum. So this is just a, an infographic that I grabbed off of, um, off of this website here. I don't, it's not that great. Like I, I don't recommend that you print this or anything. I think this is way overkill for what we're trying to talk about. And I don't think that you should try and learn about what we're doing here by using these types of tools, right? It's an okay reference. It shows you kind of where the sub area is and where the bass is and where the muddiness happens, where our voices lie and where you get the, the kind of hissy, noisy stuff, which that information is good. Like that level of granularity is good where these kind of break points are or where these general areas are. But what happened to me and what happens to a lot of people is we get caught up in thinking that you know, we can just memorize this chart and that's what we need to do. And the people that make great music have memorized all these numbers and the charts and you know exactly what frequency to cut because it's causing an issue here. And there's a little bit of that, but by and large, you just need to know that it starts at the low end. You can't even hear this 20. You don't really start hearing it until we get into the green, right? And so we get here, we get into the green, you start hearing the bass, you start feeling this in your chest, right? And then we get into the muddiness, and that's, you know the sound of muddiness, it's like washy, kind of, like that kind of just you know, trash sound, that's muddiness. And you get that a lot in the middle of an acoustic guitar, and that's the problem that most of us have recording music, is muddiness in this range, right? Then we have the human range, this is like what you would hear uh, over the t t telephone, like if you called somebody back in the day on a landline, they would cut out all this other information for a couple of reasons. One, because you don't need all this information to make out what somebody's saying. It kind of can get in the way a lot of times. So by removing all this information and uh, sending that over the phone line, it used less bandwidth, so you didn't need as much you know, to transport it. And also it ensured that we weren't distracted or that our voices weren't covered up by muddiness and phase issues. It solved a lot of the problems by just cutting off where the problems are. You know, we do that sometimes in music, but it's an effect. It's when you want the radio sound and everybody knows that sound. They do it in hip hop a lot. Uh, El Boogie does it in one of his latest singles. You should check out my uh, alter ego gangster rap superstar El Boogie. He, uh, he knows all about this stuff. So I'm showing you this spectrum kind of as a, an example of what not to really get caught up on, 
Right? These, this is kind of what people might call these, the low end, the low mids, the mid range, the high mids, the high end. You kind of already get it, and we super overcomplicate it all the time and try to memorize, well, where does the piano live, and where does the bass live, and what if I cut the kick drum and bump a little in the bass, is that going to be good? It always depends on the source material, the instrument, the room that it was recorded in, the way it was recorded. All of that is so dependent on your environment and you and what you're doing and where you're sitting and what direction you're facing. Like all that stuff matters. So trying to learn in the way where you're just memorizing stuff doesn't work. It wastes your time. And a lot of people sell you packages where they'll teach you all, like for a kick, these are the frequencies that you need to learn. Don't don't go for it. Just get yourself an EQ. I'm using the FabFilter Pro EQ. It's kind of expensive, so you might not have access to that, and that's okay, because they all work kind of in the same way. Let's just take a, a little look at the stock one that comes with Studio One. We'll open up PreSonus, and then we have Pro EQ, I think it's called. I never use it, um, but that's not to say it's not good. I just I like the FabFilter one. So here we go. We got a, pr a pretty similar representation. I'm just going to play this. I think I, we still have our uh, our vocal down, right? I'm just going to double check real quick and make sure that I'm sh actually showing my screen because that, that seems to be a thing with me. All right, <laughs> we're groovy. And now well, let's play our sound. So we have a similar representation. Let's open up our other EQ and we'll look at them both together. And then... I'm just going to pin them up so we can see them both at the same time. And we're looking at a slightly different representation of the same thing, but it's the same scale. And this is 50 here, and this is 50 here. And this doesn't even show us 20 and below, right? Because it's almost irrelevant to us. But it's showing the same pattern. It shows us kind of not the same fidelity. It's not the same resolution. We don't see all the little peaks and valleys. It's cut into smaller increments. But it's the same thing. And you can see that this stock EQ is just cut into... Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sections. And you can see all these little divisions here. And they're just, to, to break this into pieces, you could come in here and put these little things on here and just drag them like this, and it shows you what it's doing with the slider here. So you boost it, cut it, boost it, cut it, move it. All right, so it gives us a set number of points we can use to affect this signal. Same thing, though. Okay, so let's go back over here to our physics of sound. Let's just do a, a quick little review. We talked about sine waves and what happens when they meet, when, when two waves meet and they're in phase with each other, the volume goes up the amplitude changes when they're out of phase with each other or when you flip the polarity of one it cancels out and you hear nothing and we can demonstrate that pretty clearly with the sine wave because it's just one frequency but in reality when we're talking about music and sounds in the natural world we hear thousands of frequencies at any given time all at once right and parts of them add up and 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 subtract dependent on your room and your instrument and what you're processing it with. So we talked about that. We talked about um, why square rooms are bad. It's because when the sounds bounce off of the walls and they meet up in the middle, if you're in a square room, just the timing of how that works out is unfortunate, right? They all meet at the same time because you're an equal distance away from all the walls. It makes sense. Uh, the best solution for that is to either get into a different room that's not a square, that's really the best solution. You can add absorption, but you need a real, real lot of it if your room is small, so much of it that you don't have any room to move like in the room. So it's almost infeasible in a really small room. Uh, you could use headphones, which is probably the best option for most people, you use headphones. But when you use the headphones, make sure that you're referencing uh, whatever it is you're working on, on real speakers too, because real people are gonna listen to that on, on real speakers. Uh, and, and you can have phase issues between the two channels of your speakers as well. Like your left channel and your right channel are playing sounds at the same time. But if those sounds are out of phase, then mm, what's going to happen? 
It's not going to sound good. Very good. We talked about uh, the uses of uh, absorption, like how you can use these panels or, and make them. Uh, people, you see people use all sorts of stuff, um, like uh, egg crates people will put, and they'll, they do have an effect. They just don't have an effect where you need them to, where you think they do. They, and they also look stupid, so don't do it. Um, there's the Oralex foam, which looks cool. Uh, if you're doing it because it looks cool, I dig it. I've seen a lot of awesome looking studios because they use the Oralex foam and it's all colored and cut and it, it really does look cool. But that's kind of what people are doing it for. It has an effect sonically. It does absorb those frequencies, the flutter echoes in the voice. And you might want that in a voiceover booth or if you're doing a podcast, they do have a use. It's not, it's just not the use that you, you might think. Um, we talked about how there is no sound in space because space doesn't have any medium for the mechanical wave to happen on. Like if you think about ripples in water, right? You touch the water and then those water molecules touch the ones next to them and it makes waves. And that's what happens with sound. That's how sound works, right? It, touches the air molecules, they touch the ones next to them until it gets to your eardrum. Um, so it's traveling through a physical medium, our atmosphere, our, the air. In space, no sound, you just don't have it. It doesn't work. But radio, and this is, we're going to end here with kind of the full path of an audio signal from my voice to the radio. So let's pop over into Photoshop so I can draw. We'll do some drawing here. Just make a new document. I'll make it a little bit bigger. And I got my brush. I'll make it white. I just like it. Uh, All right. Cool. So let's say here's Luke's house. Like we're playing The Sims. And here's my room. Here's my speakers. Here's my computer. Here's my desk. And then we'll make me red. And then here's me. You know that the way I have the, the, this set up isn't by accident either. So the way that I'm sitting at this desk with these speakers is that I am actually equally distant from them. So these speakers are, I don't remember, uh, like maybe four feet apart from each other. The centers of their speakers are four feet apart from each other. I'm also four feet apart from each of them. So this is an equilateral triangle here happening with these speakers and my head. Right, this sound is going directly to my ears. It's pointed in the direction of my ear, and my ear is sitting, and my height, the height of my chair, is between. So my ears are between the tweeters and the uh, the woofers, right? So I'm getting the direct sound right to my ears, and that also helps minimize some of the phase issues. So it's important that you get your speakers set up the right way. All right. So I'm here, I'm playing the guitar. Let's make a guitar. Boom, boom. It's gonna be kind of like an orangey brownie color. Bam, bam, I'm jamming. He's a bad man, my jammer. How did I get to blue? I was trying to be brown here, here we go. We're drawing my guitar. It's a terrible guitar. Right, and here's my microphone. And then here we are. I'm sitting here in this position where I normally would be sitting if I was recording something. And I'm playing the sound into this microphone. So I'm playing the guitar. The guitar is hitting my microphone. And the microphone is taking that signal, the physical mechanical signal, and it's turning that into voltage. So it turns it into electricity. When the diaphragm moves, when we move that thing, it's making an electrical voltage that passes through the wires. That's why you have a mic cable. It's got three wires in it. The, it's passing voltage up and down, right? Or, or your binary on and off through it, right? There, it's actually a physical electricity that's getting generated by this. That's traveling through the cable. The electricity is going through the cable, through the copper, 
that's going into a converter here, right? That sits under my desk, right? That's where I plug my stuff into. So I plug it into what's called an analog to digital converter or an audio interface. It, it's, it has one of those built in. That's it's one of its primary purposes, right? So it converts that electrical pulse into a digital signal. So it's taking all the peaks and that or the spikes in voltage and it's turning them into zeros and ones in my, uh, audio workstation that's very groovy now we're processing that right i recorded my track it's on my hard drive cool we got it in our daw and i'm putting effects on it. i'm making it sound cool perfect it's done now awesome we take that signal right we've we've got it all mixed down it's all one file it's cool it's ready to go and we send that over do 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 through electricity right through the internet probably we're sending it over to our local radio station. We'll call it W and then a little W, TF. <laughs> WWTF, this is our local radio station, right? So we mixed down our sound. It got converted into electricity. The electricity got converted into zeros and ones. The zeros and ones we sent through this cable somehow, through the air, a bunch of different ways. It bounced through all sorts of things on the internet, and it got over to the radio station. And then we somebody listened to it. They're like, yeah, this is the hottest jam I have ever heard. We need to play this. So they take that same uh, the file or the CD or whatever you sent them, they put it in their CD player or computer, right? The computer then sends that signal to its converter here, and that takes the digital signal, turns it back into a physical signal, and then that goes out to some kind of other converter here. And now we're turning that signal into an electromagnetic signal, right? And if we remember back from, uh, from our slides over here and Tom Cruise in space, those can travel in a different way through vacuums and they, don't ha they go farther, right, than the audio ones do. So now we've converted the same signal that we made. Now it is an electromagnetic signal and we're sending that up to the roof of WWTF to a metal pole. Boom. And this is vibrating. The pole itself is vibrating, and the stuff that's on it has other poles on it, and those are vibrating, and those are sending off waves all over the place, and they're bouncing off things. They're radio waves, but they're still bouncing. They're bouncing off the ground. They're bouncing off the water. They're bouncing off the mountains. They're bouncing off the sky. They're, they're bouncing off the ionosphere. Like They go all over the place, and they bounce everywhere, and this has happened for all time. It's a natural phenomenon, but we've learned to harness it and use it to do stuff like send music or broadcasts and speech large distances intergalactically even so that's cool so we got our signal now now it's it's a terrestrial radio wave right now we've converted it into a radio wave and which is also an electromagnetic wave and this is traveling out into our local area from this antenna but thing is we are in the valley and wwtf is right now let's make this a different color I'll just make this like a light blue. I know my colors are messed up. It's fine. It's just what I had available at the time. Don't judge me. So what WWTF is unfortunately in a valley. All right. And then here's where it flattens out. This is not uh, topographically correct. This is just an example for everybody. Before the comments explode, this is not what it looks like in Douglas. Whatever. Shut up. So here's WWTF, a very, very poorly placed at the bottom of a valley, and it's got a big, tall antenna because it has to to overcome bouncing off of these walls. So we get up here, and then cool. But now what's going on is we've got a road over here and our cars. This is a, it was supposed to be a sedan, but it's more like a monster truck. So imagine this is the bad guy in Roadhouse. Remember that movie Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze, where he was uh, the leader of the underground bouncer circuit? Well, the bad guys in that movie, they drove monster trucks, as most bad guys do. So this is 
this is the bad guys from that movie Roadhouse, right? And they happen to love our music. They're big fans of us, right? It, actually, if I recall correctly, they're not all big fans of us. I think, the, I think Patrick Swayze actually ripped out the throat of their leader. So I don't think he's listening to us anymore. But the rest of them that, he, that Patrick Swayze bounced into line, they love us. So here we go. They, and now we have an antenna here. Right, so maybe we're able to pick this signal up. It's unlikely because we're kind of here and the sound, it might bounce off of the uh, atmosphere and come back down and we might get it, but it's not a very direct route. This isn't going to be a very strong signal to us because of our topographic situation. And similar to the way that the sound waves bounce off our room, radio waves bounce off the, you know, ge uh, ge geography, topology, topology, I think, of the earth. So what happens, what we've done to deal with this or to, to manage this is at the top of these, strategically, we have placed over years and years and years uh, towers. So at the top of the valley, here we've got this tower. And this, here's the signal. So we get it. And then something happens in here, right? We take this signal and then we have another antenna. This antenna receives the signal that we're broadcasting here. Some logic, some circuitry in here amplifies that signal. It makes it stronger because we've lost some of it because of this distance, this travel. So we get something high on the top of a hill, and then we, we grab the signal from there, we amplify it, and then we take another antenna, and then we broadcast that out again, which is then picked up here by the antenna in your car. And that's how radio waves that's how radio works or the terrestrial radio that we kind of grew up with. That's one theory, right? There's another popular theory that these things up here, I'm calling them towers. I don't know what other people might call them, but these, uh, these towers that we have at the top of the Hills with all the different antennas, these are actually, um, implemented by foreign interests and they're used to radiate waves that actually, decrease the strength of your immune system so that China and Russia are able to infiltrate the United States after they take us out with coronavirus. So, I mean, it could be this is just a repeater that's taking a signal from a radio station. It's repeating it so that we can hear it in our cars. It could also be uh, the deep state using radio waves to control our minds or to physically decrease the strength of our immune system so that they can sow chaos in on the American democracy. I don't know which one it is. It's one of those two things, though. So with this, this is kind of the overview of how sound works and how it relates to us. And in the next um, works, the coming workshops, we're going to talk about um, more kind of in the field type stuff. We're going to record things and see how this relates to music and how we can get good at learning a DAW and do work, get work done and have it sound good. Cool. Uh, we got about 15 minutes left. I'm going to hang around for a bit, see if we get any questions, if I can answer them. Cool. If not, I will see you next week. Um, thank you for all your time and hanging out with me for these things. I hope that you get something out of them.